Hello and welcome to another episode of the CG Garage. This is episode number 300. Yay! Yay! Hooray! We can't have the big party that we had for the 100th episode because, you know, big parties aren't allowed during the era of COVID. But that did not preclude us from having a fabulous, fabulous episode with someone that's very special, uh, someone who I just if you had told me, Kristen, you know, 25 years ago, whenever I started using 3D Studio in DOS on a 486 computer, if you ever told me that I will be doing a podcast with Gary Yost, first of all, I would have said, what the hell is a co podcast? Because they didn't exist <laughs> back then. But I would also just not believe it because he is really, really, really great. Uh, he is an amazing person. He's the guy who basically started uh, 3D Studio and uh, did incredible things, including its transition to Windows when he went uh, and did Macs as well uh, and does uh, some incredible things. I have been a fan of Gary Yost's work for a long time and his philosophy and all the products he's done. But it's not until this podcast that I became a fan of Gary Yost, the person who is was surprising in his in his excitement and everything wasn't he amazing yeah like i didn't expect all the stuff that he <laughs> said he was gonna right. say like he's just an amazing person yeah um outside of even the cg world just everything <laughs> really cool yeah yeah and he was really re revealing a bunch of stuff to us you know that was very interesting about you know what it's been like to be him you know going and he had a lot of health issues when he mm -hmm. was uh, uh in in his past and and dealing with all those things um and it was really really incredible to, to hear about that as well as the fact that you know he really wanted to be an artist when he started he wanted to create cool looking stuff and he made the program to made, do the stuff and it wasn't until much later in his life that he got to to be an artist and be creative in a lot of ways so it's really great to see that uh out of out of gary and and hear all those stories uh he was really also what's really nice about him is that he basically just kept on talking and i just let him talk and he said a really <laughs> great a really great stories i will note that even though we're doing a video podcast we're new, using a new system now for doing video podcasts which i think will look really good I'm excited about that. Unfortunately, that system was not was not quite working with Gary uh, when we did it, and we lost his video feed. So you, you won't if we look go to our YouTube, you won't he won't be there. He won't his his video is not working, but you can still hear all of his stories, and it still still sounds great. So sorry about that, Gary, but I'm sure it's fine. Most most almost everyone watch, or listens to these podcasts anyway, so it's fine. Uh, but okay, that enough about about this. The 300th episode is really great. Uh, it's been almost exactly six years that I started this. I can't believe it that it's been six years, and I hope for uh, a many more years to come. Uh, all right. So, that being said, Kristen, who are what are some announcements that we have? All right. So you can find these out at chaosgroup.com/events. Uh, the first one we've talked about a lot. A um, few weeks left is the illumination challenge. The deadline is November 30th. Um, and the next one is just something small. It's a webinar. It's on November 24th. Sorry, not small, but they will be talking about VRA 5 for 3DS Max, and it will be in Russian. So if you know how to speak <laughs> Russian or listen to it, listen yep. to it. Um, it will showcase the latest features and benefits, benefits of version 5. So, yeah, and all of these can be found. Us. And all yeah, of these can online. be found. Online, so uh, chaosgroup.com slash events is where you found that information. In terms of products, uh, our big announcements uh, by the, the the day that this podcast comes out, which is Monday the something. Nice. Nice, nice. <laughs> I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, V-Ray 5 for SketchUp will be out. So uh, make sure and check it out. Lots and lots and lots of new features uh, that are really cool. So there's going to be some very cool things to look it up. Look it up on our site, chaosgroup.com, and get all your information about V-Ray 5 for SketchUp, uh, which is going to be pertinent to uh, our current, uh, to um, a lot of inf you know things that you guys may be doing. So uh, I'd really like to hear your, your, your feedback and your ideas on V-Ray 5 for SketchUp. All right. Uh, is that it? Is that all the announcements we have, Kristen? Yep, that's all. That's, that's it? it? Okay. All right. That being said, please enjoy this incredible podcast, number 300, with Mr. Gary Yost. Welcome to another CG Garage, where the chaos group talks. You'll know it's over when the last bucket drops. We're going to fire off rays. In high dynamic range, we know that ambient occlusion is passe. Global illumination won't lead you astray. And while image-based lighting 
is really swell. You need to make sure everything has for now. Yeah, so as uh, as we were saying just before we started re- uh, recording is that uh, uh, basically I was um, uh, uh, really sort of learning uh, Matsubo's 3D Studio was the first real big 3D package that I would use uh, quite a bit. Uh, and this was back in 93, I guess was when yeah, it was. So, you know, that was release three, I think. Yeah. Uh, no, maybe it was still 90, it was released too in 93, I think, 94 might have been released three. It's hard to remember all the release schedules. Yeah. And I just... Yeah, so, well, good, good luck to you, I mean. <laughs> I, it's kind of funny, because I remember, you know, sitting there, like, it's like, wow, this software is really cool. I mean, it's great, and it runs on a PC, you know, and it wasn't, you know, you didn't need these $50,000 SGIs to, to run it, and you could do an enormous amount of it. It was super friendly for what I was trying to do. Uh, it worked, uh, you know, at that time I was doing some modeling in AutoCAD mostly, you know, <laughs> that's what sure. I was on. so, uh, I was trying to like experiment with it and it was, it was a really cool thing. And I think I remember, you know, saying like, who this, this Yoast group guys are really cool. And I just can't imagine that I'm sitting here talking to Gary Yoast <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> yeah. I'm still alive. <laughs> yeah. So it's that, kind of uh, 30 years later. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It is kind of funky to, to, to think about that and, and what that means. Uh, but how, how, did, how did you even get into programming and computer graphics? I mean, where, where, where did all, that all start? What was your inspiration to get into that? <laughs> uh, okay, we go way back. Uh, yeah. Probably the mid-70s, 74, 75. Yeah. Um, I was still in high school and... Uh, my friends and I, we made little eight millimeter movies and we had, you know, a dark room and we would take pictures and we would sit around uh, occasionally smoking pot and dreaming about this kind of virtual studio that didn't exist yet. Right. And how, you know, one day we'd be able to, you know, in our bedrooms even make movies. Who knew, you know, and uh, we even had a word for it. We called it Surreally Studios. Okay. And, um, you know, we were influenced by, you know, the great kind of uh, auteurs, you know, uh-huh. uh, Truffaut and all these, all these people who kind of did it all themselves. Right. And, um, you know, Bunuel and all these guys who showed us that, you know, if you were super creative, you could manage uh, an awful lot of the, of the process. And so this is in the 70s. And... Um, uh, I w- also, at the time, I had uh, some really serious health problems growing mm. up. I was born with uh, a, an autoimmune disorder. I was born without a spleen, and it led to just a, a cascade of autoimmune disorders throughout wow. my early teens and throughout my teens. And um, I ended up not being able to go to school very much. I was in the hospital a lot during the, my mid-teens and late teens, and... Um, Although I got accepted to uh, Northwestern University and a couple other schools, um, I ended up uh, getting a diploma after two and a half years of high school and um, not being able to go to college because I wasn't well enough. And I ended up just kind of working in the sound business, doing like with a friend, a cousin actually, mm-hmm. who got me a job in it with a sound company and kind of working in the sound business, wanted to work in lighting, wanted to do more theatrical work. And um, by 1980, I uh, had kind of gotten out of that, got my FCC first class phone operator's license to be a television engineer, uh, did all that studying by myself. And um, around that time is when, you know, the Apple II was coming out and the Timex Sinclair was coming yeah. out. And, and so I, I had a Sinclair I, ZX88. Th- that's exactly what I had. Yeah. <laughs> nice. What, do, you, do you remember what year that was exactly? Was that 81? Uh, yeah, it was about, I want to say. 80 or 81. Could have, yeah, about that. Yeah. It might, might have been an 80. I don't know mm-hmm. if it was an 88. And yeah. uh, 
so I yeah I taught myself how to program in BASIC on it. Yeah, that's all I had. Remember that? <laughs> yeah. And and I you know was moving little dots around yep. on the screen. I think you had forty pixels by eighty eight pixels or something like that. No, that many. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so uh, I just loved the this act of moving something around on a virtual screen. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I wasn't able to um, do much work because I was still. Uh, had a lot of physical issues at the time, mm -hmm. and and actually uh, by late 1981, early 1982, um, I developed uh, colon cancer. Oh dear! I was only 23 years old, Oof. and yeah. um, <laughs> it was just the craziest thing. Uh, on the way, uh, like on the way to this process of all these surgeries I had in 1982. I had this crazy idea to write a letter to the uh, CEO of Atari, um, okay. asking if he would uh, just make me some sort of ward of Atari. Um, I had looked at like the Apple II and the Atari 800, mm -hmm. which had just come out, and the Atari 800 had this, you know, antic chip, and it could do sprites, right. and it was obviously much more tuned to graphics. Right. And I thought, wow, that that's that's pretty cool. Uh, better than the Apple II. And so I, I it was the craziest thing. I one day I wrote this two paragraph letter to Ray Kassar. Raymond Kassar was the CEO of Atari in 1982 um, when it was owned by Time Warner. OK. And um, and I, I told him what I was about to go through with all these surgeries that year. And uh, I, I made some hokey comment at the end about whether or not there still was a Santa Claus. I mean, no shit. <laughs> I actually pulled that out of the hat. <laughs> and I yep. really didn't think anything was going to become of it. I mean, I literally called, you know, uh, 408-555-1212, asked for Atari's <laughs> number, asked the, asked the secretary the name of the CEO and what their mailing address was. Right. And I, I wrote this two-paragraph, one-pager. Uh -huh. And uh, that was like in March of 1982. And and my surgery was in June. And it was like six weeks later. Nothing happened for six weeks. Okay. And so maybe May sometime, middle of May, just yeah. a few weeks before I was going to go in the hospital, uh, I got this little, I still have it. I guess it's over in this cabinet over there. <laughs> I got this little white envelope in the mailbox. And I didn't even like notice a return. There was no return address. Right. It was just this white envelope. But then I could feel this embossed thing on the corner. And it was the embossed Atari logo. Oh, wow. I was like, what the fuck? And I, I opened it up and I pulled this card out and it was from the desk of Raymond Kassar. And in it, he says, oh, you know, hi there. Loved your letter. You sound like a really brave young man. I'm going to hook you up as a grantee with the Atari Institute for Educational Action Research. Okay. Which was a fairly like going concern run by this great man named Ted Kahn. Mm -hmm. um, and... And they kind of adopted me as their prototypical user who had to work remotely on, on projects. And, and I became the beta tester for their control data Plato terminal emulator. Okay. Which they were doing along with CDC, right? Okay. CDC made these really expensive touchscreen Plato terminals in right. 1982, and they had a network. I mean, the the cyber Plato terminals were the prototype. You know, that was the internet then. Right. And 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 they had terminals in prisons, and you could get on and chat with prisoners. And my, <laughs> it was it was just it was amazing. You could chat with people all over the world. And it was this great bitmapped uh, display that you had to you you'd press a button on the joystick and you could zoom in to see the full, you know, display and scroll around over the virtual display. Wow. And so I, hel I helped them like work out the bugs in that. And uh, I had a you know I had a it was a tough year, 1982. But I also I you know I I, I learned more basic. I learned some Pascal because mm -hmm. um, there was a, a Pascal uh, package. Um, right. Yep. For the 800, and I taught myself how to do that. I I I was not like a great. Uh, I was never a great programmer because my mind is uh, way too nonlinear. Okay. Uh, I I you know I would have been diagnosed with ADHD as a kid if if there was that diagnosis then. Right. And so I I you know I taught myself how to do these things. I understood 
how it worked. I took some assembly language classes at University of California, Berkeley, like non-matriculating evening classes. Okay. Just to learn kind of a little bit how the architecture worked. And uh, I, I asked the people at Atari if they could introduce me to somebody who was involved in the, like another user. And they introduced me to uh, a guy named Jim Caparell who had a Atari magazine called Antic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I needed a job and like he needed a guy to sell ad space in Antic. So in 19, the end of 1982 from my home, I was able to start selling ad space. And, um, and then I don't know exactly when it was, but Jack Trammell bought Atari from Warner Brothers in, I think it was like 19, end of 83 or early 84. Okay. And the user-based Atari uh, software catalog. So there were, Atari had this thing called the Atari Program Exchange where end users who wrote little programs could get them self-published through this very informal publishing arm of Atari. Okay. But when Trammell bought the company, he just cut all that loose. Mm -hmm. And um, there were quite a few really good programs, including one called the Deep Blue Sea Compiler. And okay. so there was like a C compiler somebody had wrote for the Atari 800. Wow. And, and, and so I called that guy up and um, I forgot his name right now. Um, but he, uh, he agreed to sign with us. And we started this little catalog inside of Antic Magazine with the, the, the C compiler. Okay. And um, we then picked up another dozen, you know, programmers who had published cool pieces of software and kind of had a pretty large catalog of these independent things. And we, when the Atari ST came out and the 68,000 enabled, you know, more complex things, we, we wanted to branch out. And we saw that, um, that Tom Hudson had, uh, had written a 2D paint program for a company called Batteries Included in Toronto. And it was uh -huh. a really, it was the, it was the best 2D paint program on the, uh, on the ST. Mm -hmm. um, actually, it was like the only one at the time outside of Atari's Neo paint program, which was you know, shipped <coughs> with, the, with the computer. Right, right, and, right. And it, and it was great. And uh, and so I called up Tom, and I and I, you know, although he worked for our arch rival, uh, Analog Magazine, so there okay. were two two Atari magazines at the time. One was the West Coast Antic with the West Coast Hippies, and then there's the Boston-based Analog with all the button-down, hardworking. <laughs> types. Uh -huh. And, and so, uh, you know, I was like, Hey Tom, uh, I'd really like to work with you on uh, a new graphics program. Cause that's where my true love is. I know that, you know, we could do some interesting things together. And, uh, he, and then he said, this was probably in October, November of, uh, 1985 or something. Okay. And, uh, he said, well, let's get together at Comdex in yep. December in okay. Vegas. And so uh, we met up and uh, he showed up with a little three and a half inch floppy disk and we put it in the, uh, the demo unit and he brought up this thing called Solid States. And it was okay. uh, essentially had a whole bunch of lists, you know, it was a vertex and a face list. Uh -huh. And it could display a little rotating cube uh, in a little viewport. Right. And he said, well, this is what I want to do next. I want to do 3D. And... Uh, <laughs> And I said, this is great. You know, this is, this is what I want to do also. Right. And, and, and I said, you know, by the way, have you seen what they're showing over at the Apple booth across the street? Because we were in the, in the old funky West Hall at Vegas you know, oh, yeah, across yeah, yeah. the street. Yeah, yeah, and I was yeah. like, uh, let me take you across the street to the big hall where Apple's showing this thing called Easy 3D. Okay. And uh, it was uh, the first 3D thing on the Mac. Um, by a company called Enabling Technologies out of Chicago. Right. And, and we brought him over there and we, you know, we grabbed the demo guy and said, you know, show us this thing. And mm -hmm. so uh, he took us through Easy 3D and then me and Tom walked away from the booth and Tom looked at me and said, oh, I can do that much better. Right. And, and I was like, great, let's get going. And okay. it was like a week later, he gave me the first uh, kind of, you know, prototype of CAD 3D. Okay. Which was our, you know, 68,000 based Atari thing. And that ended up 
uh, turning into a whole line of software. So that was 85, it, you know, that probably came out in 86 and 86, mm -hmm. 87, 8, we, you know, we went through CAD 3D 2.0 and then a guy named Mark Kimball at Tektronix who loved CAD 3D gave me a call one day and said, I think you need to get a plane ticket up to Portland. I have something mm -hmm. to show you. And so I, I, I got on a, on a plane to Portland. I showed up at Tektronix and, you know, Tektronix, right? Mm -hmm. Very large industrial scientific corporation. Yep. And uh, I meet up with Mark. He gives me a badge. He takes me back. There's a 68,000 running Atari. So, yeah, it says Atari 68,000. And I was like, what's that? And he boots up CAD 3D. Wow. And then he reaches me behind the thing and he brings out a, a pair of goggles. And I'm like, what's that? He says, these are liquid crystal, sh liquid crystal shutter glasses. <laughs> and I wrote using the API that Tom put into CAD 3D, because we were the first people that, that had any sort right. of an API in, uh -huh. into our code. I wrote a program that takes the display list out of the ST and, and, and it synchronizes it with these goggles. And so you can now do things stereoscopically. You can, you can render stereoscopically what? just by pressing this button in this little plugin to CAD 3D. And I put it on and you had to dim the lights because it was like 15 hertz per eye. Oh, oof. <laughs> that's a little low. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, like, holy cow, you know, yeah. he had things, it was, it was incredible. Right. And so he said, you know, I think I've convinced the powers that be here. We could do a consumer product that you could sell along with CAD 3D. And we ended up coming out with this thing called Stereo Tech. And it was this pair of goggles that, you know, you can Google it. Um, right. And, and, and then we, you know, we did a whole bunch of other add-ons using this uh, API that Tom had put in. You know, there was like an anti-aliasing thing, and then there was a whole scripting language and, um, and other little things that we added on. And we saw like, this is the power of an API in a 3D package. And then, um, you know, we would, we would go to Comdex again for each of those subsequent two years and show this stuff and people from Autodesk would come by. Right. And look at it and go, you know, whoa, you know. Right. And, and the first year they offered us jobs uh -huh. and we said, no, yep. we're, no. And then the second year they came and they said, you know, how would you like a publishing deal where, you know, you can take a crack at doing something like, a, like, like the 3d, like that, like 3d content creation system, kind of like the AutoCAD of 3d. Okay. And, and, uh, you know, we jumped at that and, and, you know, so we got this contract with Autodesk to do the AutoCAD of 3d, you know, really had no idea what we were doing. Right. Um, and, you know, it was by looking at uh, other software that was out there at the time, like Wavefront, um, right. that, that you were familiar with. And uh, Vertigo, actually, mm -hmm. uh, was very inspiring. I'm sure you could see a lot of similarities between yeah. the Vertigo modeling tools and our Lofter. I love the Lofter. It, it was so cool. <laughs> you know, I played with the Lofter for so long. I remember yeah. just sitting there for hours like, okay, this shape here and then this curves here. It was so much fun. It was amazing. Yeah, and that was really inspired by Vertigo. Uh -huh. um, they did really great things. Uh, if I haven't thanked them uh, un un until now, I would do that now. <laughs> so, you know, so we... You know, we, we did that and, and then really it, it, you know, it started to snowball. But of course, um, the real story behind all this is the collaborations between all the really talented people. So, of course, mm. by now you've already picked up on the fact that um, this relationship I had with Tom mm -hmm. um, had a lot of synergy uh, associated with it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what we also used to call back in the Cerulee Studio days, high causality. Okay. And, um, and I really saw how, you know, how useful the synergy was in, as a force multiplier. Right. And, and so we were looking for, you know, someone to do all the keyframing and animation stuff. And there was a guy at, uh, at Autodesk in the product management department, a guy named Walt Spivak, who still lives down the road from me here in <laughs> Mill Valley. And, and, and I had been lamenting to him, uh, you know, that, we didn't really have an engineer who could do the keyframer and and how I 
I really subscribe to the rock band theory of software development teams in that all the members had to meld on a, um, you know, to create a gestalt that was um, kind of this unified, uh, you know, I had been a musician when I was a kid, so I understood the feeling of flow that happens when you're playing music with other people. And I wanted to recapture that feeling of flow. Right. And one, one day Walt came up to me and said, you know, my neighbor in Mill Valley and I were literally talking over the backyard fence the other day. And he told me that he was really unhappy with his current publisher, Electronic Arts. Okay. And I was like, well, who's your neighbor? He's like, well, Dan Silva. And okay. I happened to have known Dan Silva, I think at a SIGGRAPH in Atlanta, we walked from the hotel to the hall together uh -huh. a couple of years prior to that. And uh, he was such a great guy. And, uh, you know, I heard Walt say his name and I kind of knew instantly that uh, this was going to be, uh, you know, a wonderful opportunity. And, and so we asked Dan to come into uh, uh, Autodesk facility at 2320 Marine Ship Way, the old facility by the boat docks. And we, we, I was really adamant about not telling him what we wanted. Mm -hmm. I wanted to hear what he wanted to do. And if what he wanted to do was aligned with, you know, where we were at, it, it was, it was going to mean a lot. Mm -hmm. So we asked him what he wanted to do. And, and he said two things. And, you know, I wish I could remember what the first thing was, but it was <laughs> like completely off the wall and not relevant to anything what, that, that we were doing. But right. the second thing was, I'd love to do a keyframer for a 3D animation package. Oh, perfect. There you go. And it was That's like, exactly. boom. <laughs> We all were in the room. I mean, Tom was in the room and, you know, we were all in the room uh -huh. and, you know, you could just feel it. Right. Right. And, um, and so, you know, you're hired uh -huh. and that was in September of 1991. And, and, you know, we, we, uh, dealt with all the contractual stuff and I went to Dan's house on October 21st, 19, no, what's 19, what is 1989? What am I saying? Yeah. Because, I, 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 w I went to his house on October 21st, 1989, and um, he signed the contract, and I took that contract over back to Autodesk, and that's when the earthquake happened. Oh, the, you wow. You know, the big yeah. earthquake yeah, yeah, yeah. of, you know, in October of 1989. Yeah. So that was, that was a really big day. Yep. Um, on so many levels. And, you know, the, the, you know, the Autodesk was built on fill, so the whole building was, you know, really moving a lot. And You're right. It, it became quite, quite, quite an exciting day. I'll never forget it. Um, and so now we had, you know, Dan and Tom, mm -hmm. and uh, there were a bunch of issues to work out. Um, you know, Windows was, uh, you know, didn't exist yet, or yep. it was actually, it was 16-bit. Um, right. Uh, so it was useless for addressing large memory. Right. It was and Windows 3.1 or 3.0 at that point or something yeah, like that, right? Yeah. It, was, it had very pathetic memory addressing ability. And right. so we were just working under DOS. Right. And, um, and, 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 you know, we were using the Farlap extender, which was a 32 bit kind of memory management, um, right. uh, kind of like, uh, kind of framework. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, you know, Dan and Tom, uh, sprinted. And so the synergy was like, so again, this goes back to this issue of flow and collaboration mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, without going into tons of details, cause you know, the story from there, I mean, we we brought in um, well we had this this really great API in release two of 3D Studio called iPass, mm -hmm. which you know allowed anyone to write these extensions, and we we used that as a test bed to really understand what a good API you know ought to look like you know how a non modal right. you know I was just you know the iPass thing just only went so far, you know, but we were looking. So, so what we were trying to do is create this collaborative sense of flow among all the developers of the world. Yeah. And, and so, uh, we had, <laughs> uh, we had noticed that one of our, one of our great iPass enthusiasts was this, I think it was a teenager named Rolf Bertig uh -huh. up in Seattle. And, uh, he was just prolific and you know, one of those people who had a pure can-do attitude. There was n no challenge was too much. In fact, n challenges weren't even a challenge. They right. were just an exciting opportunity for him. And 
and he was super young, you know, and we were already 30. <laughs> we were already right. getting pretty old. And, and so we offered uh, Rolf a full partnership in the Yoast Group. So Tom and I were already full partners. Right. And then we, we essentially, um, uh, you know, uh, we, uh, we just made him a full partner. So now we were thirds. Mm -hmm. and, and we asked him to write the inverse kinematics package. Oh, for, right. And so he wrote this beautiful inverse kinematics package. And at the same time, of course, while he was writing that, we were coming up against the limitations of the iPass interface really hard. Right. And, and just the overall limitations of the DOS platform. And, and, uh, and Microsoft had come to us and, and showed us some very, very early versions of Windows NT. Y okay, yeah. Right. So well, we also saw, okay. Windows 4 or Windows NT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yep. it was 32-bit memory addressing. And, right. Um, and so, uh, you know, we immediately saw the writing on the wall. Like, if we want, if, like, we either could just basically stop here mm -hmm. or we just start over from scratch, essentially. Yep. And, um, and so, but we needed to continue supporting our code. And I had a uh, casual relationship with the chief scientist at Wavefront, this incredibly brilliant man, Don Britton. Okay. Dr. Don Britton. Uh -huh. and, uh, and so I called him up at Wavefront and said, hey, man, we'll make you a full partner you know, with us. We'll go, you know, we'll go forzies. Okay. If you want to play with us and, you know, and help us, you know, rewrite. Because actually he had come to me at Autodesk to show him the kinds of experiments he was doing with Windows NT, like just a couple of weeks prior, like Microsoft went to Wavefront also and showed him that. Okay. And he had done some experiments, but w Wavefront did not want to go to Windows and he was disappointed. Mm -hmm. And so I call him up and say, hey, you're interested in Windows? Let's do this Windows thing. And he said, well, actually, Microsoft just offered me a job okay. in Seattle as being like chief scientist of blah, 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 blah. All right. And, and I was, you know, disheartened. Right. But I didn't give up. And I uh, worked really hard over the next few weeks to convince him that staying in Santa Barbara, where he, the beautiful Santa Barbara where he was living, was going to be a much better proposition than having to move up to rainy Seattle. Okay. Because they were requiring him to move with his two daughters, wife and two daughters. Yep. And that was the thing that really, you know, allowed him to say no to Microsoft and yes to us. And again, like going back to this issue of collaboration right. and flow, um, Don, while we were doing like the release four and a half of 3D, 3DS DOS, right. um, he was bringing up all this architecture, really inspired a lot by you know, what we had seen from Symbolics. Okay. So the primary inspiration for Max was really what had happened at Symbolics and what they had done with Lisp and all that. And, oh, right. Um, you know, we were, I mean, we were standing on the shoulders of the giants of, you know, the previous 10 years. I mean, right. I could go through the litany of all these amazing people right. who had, you know, who were our inspiration, right? And then going back to Dr. Sutherland before all that. Mm -hmm. But I, we don't have the time to go through like the, <laughs> the amazing people who we were inspired by. Right. But, you know, um, Craig, uh, Craig uh, from Symbolics, uh, who, you know, so, this, so, you know, we wanted to do something that great. Right. Um, but a little bit more accessible. And, and so Don did that in the background while we finished up our DOS obligations. And, you know, we came out with this version one of Max, which was really 0 0.7 or something. Right. Uh, in uh, 1992 five or six, I guess we showed it in 95, blew the doors off uh, SIGGRAPH. Yeah. We showed, Microsoft had just bought Soft Image. I remember. Um, and I remember. they thought they were such hot shit. And then we showed, you know, Michael Gerard and Susan Amkraut's bipedal animation thing yep. and all sorts of stuff. And we had these huge crowds. And we were like, what the fuck? Where did that come from? <laughs> like, we had kept it a really good secret that yep. what we were doing. And... Um, and so in, in, on that note about blowing the doors off of SIGGRAPH, I'll take you back to SIGGRAPH 19, 
89, uh -huh. when Alias had found out about what we were doing on the PC with 3DS DOS. We showed the first DOS version at, in, in July of 1989. Yeah. Alias issued a memo to all of their staff and sales reps about how our little DOS toy was no threat to Alias. <laughs> And that they should not worry about it because, you know, it's just this Autodesk is a nobody. Right. And they're never going to get anywhere in the, in the field of 3D. And you can just forget about these guys. And yep. I, I, I don't know if I still have that memo. It was so funny. It was all being passed around. Did you see this? They're fucking scared of you guys. Right. So this goes, so now we jump to SIGGRAPH 1995. And yep. like the Microsoft people, they're all standing there going, ah. Yeah. And um but then why did Microsoft buy Soft Dimash? I oh, mean they yes. wanted to do that just to move people over to Windows. That must have been, you know, they wanted to get that a, was a piece of that, that pie, That was a big right? reason they wanted to show Windows as being a um you know, professional content creation platform. I mean they right. had all the money in the world. They um, just bought them and then fully, they dumped them right after that. <laughs> yeah, it was a little while. They didn't yeah. it wasn't it wasn't immediate, but yeah, it was yeah, I mean, that's a whole other side story. I, right. I, I remember pieces of that story, but not all the details. But it, it made right. some people very, very rich. Yeah, you know, sure. Really. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, so we had all this flow going on. I mean, we were with a small team of really four people. It was Don and Rolf mm -hmm. and Dan and me. And then, you know, a couple other. Gus Gruba was a really important part of our team. And then Jack Powell was our tech writer and, uh, you know, resident human. <laughs> And um, now Phil was telling me you guys were doing a lot of work remotely from different locations. This is one uh, of the first times you, that anyone oh, had really a, done that. Boy, that's a great story. I, I yeah, that's kind of worth noting. So, yeah. so yeah, that's kind of funny. So, up until nineteen ninety three, right? Uh, the it was really the 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 you know the. The source library was very easy to manage between Tom and Dan with check-ins and just with two people, it, it just was doable. Uh -huh. um, and, and we were using uh, 1200 baud modems and it's not like the repository was huge or anything. Okay. Um, and then, you know, Don did his thing. And then when we started to, uh, so we, so we were, I guess, I wish I could remember the exact dates, but we were about to sign the contract with Autodesk for Max. Okay. And um, we hadn't signed it yet, but, you know, we were a functioning team and we were trying to put together, a, you know, a repository with some sort of a source management program that worked. And we were still using 1200 baud modems. And <laughs> that's uh, fast. <laughs> well, it wasn't even the speed. We were just getting line drops and things that yeah. were... The speed would have been one thing. It would have been fine, but we just didn't have the reliability we needed. Right. And, and it was like literally the week I was supposed to sign the contract with, with, with Carol Bartz, you know, right. at, at Autodesk. And um, I was pretty despondent. I actually thought that I wasn't going to be able to sign the contract because Tom was in Kansas. Dan was here in Marin County. I was in San Francisco. Don was in Santa Barbara. And no one was going to move. I mean, that was the whole point was that we were decentralized which allowed us all to work, you know, 110 hour work weeks. Right. <laughs> um, and our wives would just kind of take care of us and, you know, feed us food every <laughs> once in a while. Right. And, and that was, that was cause you know, that again, our force multiplier was that we just had all these efficiencies. We didn't have to deal with water cooler gossip and office politics and all that crap. Right. And so, uh, like I said, I was despondent and didn't think I'd be able to sign the contract cause we were having such problems. And Gus Gruba, who was, uh, he was in California at the time, in the mountains, uh, he, when I was, you know, bitching to him about this problem, he said that he had just heard about ISDN, that right. this, you know, integrated A services new kind of digital internet. network. <laughs> it's like, it's reliable, inter, you know, reliable high-speed internet. I don't mm -hmm. remember what the speed was. It was maybe, you know... I think it was like 4,800 or something. 4,800 or <laughs> yeah. maybe 96, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> um, but like super reliable. And if you could get it to your house, um, it would be fine. But not all houses had it available. So we all checked right. with our local, you know, phone operators. And one of us didn't have it at the time. But 
but convinced the phone company to get it. Okay. Might have been Tom, I forget, but it might have been Tom. And uh, after lots of negotiating with the phone company and pleading, mm -hmm. um, you know, we all uh, got a commitment to get it. And then I was able to sign the contract with Autodesk. And then, yeah, we did the entire thing remotely. So what we would do is we would get together for um, like five days at my house in San Francisco. I had a big old house in San Francisco and my wife would leave and stay with the friend in Santa Fe. And, you know, we would all just live there for a week while we went through all of our lists of, you know, task lists of things that we needed to do. Sure. And, and it was these crazy, you know, all day sessions and we, you know, hit the local Chinese restaurant for dinner and get, you know, look, study our fortunes from the fortune cookies very carefully. Right. <laughs> and, and, and I started to tape these fortunes from the fortune cookies into the specs that I would give to Autodesk. There would be like, everyone would have like a fortune, like your plans are going to succeed. <laughs> and they look with an arrow, be like, look. Nice. And uh, I think our code name for the first version of Max was Jaguar. Oh, right. Yeah. And I still have all those specs somewhere. I could, you know, wow. share them. I'm sure Tom has them. He has everything. Wow. Uh, and, and so, you know, we just, so yeah, that's how we did it. So we'd get together and then we'd just go back to our houses. We'd work for like 12 months on a release. And, uh, and then we would, uh, then we'd kind of take a break for a month and then it, I think it actually got to be, I think, 17 months, 17 month release cycles. Okay. And, um, you know, we did that for two releases and there was a, a fair amount of burnout because, you know, we were five people with, with Jack and maybe six with Gus and, um, and it was literally 110 hour weeks and, you know, we had no days off. I was a, I was a very tough uh, I was very tough on the yeah. guys and, and we had these obligations and we had this shot at it. And, um, Tom got married before we shipped, I don't know, release two maybe. Okay. And he wanted to go on a honeymoon. I think he'd even made reservations, flight reservations and hotel reservations in Australia. And I had to be a real asshole and, um, tell him that he had to cancel those and, um, and go wow. after we shipped in April. And wow. it was really, it was hard. It was hard on me, um, mm. to be that kind of a jerk, but, um, yeah. we had these obligations. And so, you know, we got through release two and then it became really obvious that this was going to be a hamster wheel that, um, that, you know, that was going to go on interminably. Right. Little did I know, right. To 2020, it's the 30th anniversary. Right. Um, yeah, it's the 30th like anniversary. It's, yeah, it's true. Interminably. Yeah. And, uh, and in addition, uh, my health issues hadn't gone away. I mm. had had surgery in 1982, but it was actually in a, I'm not going to get into any details, but it was an experimental surgery. Okay. I was the first person with this surgery in, in San Francisco and it didn't actually go very well. And I had been suffering with the side effects of this experimental surgery for, 18 years and okay. I was in and out of the hospital throughout this whole experience. I mean, there were SIGGRAPHs where I'd be in the emergency room of the hospital before the show started. I don't you know if anyone remembers the SIGGRAPH in Orlando in 1994, I think okay. um, where I didn't show up till like noon or one o'clock the first day of the show. Cause I was in the emergency room. Wow. Getting transfused, getting blood transfusions. Wow. Right. Yeah. And, and then there was, there was in 19, early 1997, I was in the hospital. I had just had a stroke. Oh my gosh. And it was a small stroke, but I like, I lost the use of my right arm and leg for a while. And, um, it was just obvious that the schedule was killing me. Right. And, uh, I had to get out and I had no leverage at all with Autodesk though. Although we owned these patents and we owned all the intellectual property, they owned the right to market the program, mm -hmm. right? They owned the rights to do anything with it. So we couldn't, we, we couldn't go to someone else and say, Hey, you know, would you like to get into the 3d, 3d business with this thing? Right. We were, we were over a barrel with them. And so, I mean, 
you know, I had to, we, we had to hire a, you know, mergers and acquisition, you know, commercial bank to negotiate. There was this guy, Eric Hare at Autodesk, who was, you know, their chief operating officer at the time. It was like, mm-hmm. a, he was brutal. Yeah. And, you know, it was not, they did not want a win-win situation. And we did, we did okay, but like, you know, it wasn't like the sale of soft homage to, you know, right. Danielle did like 10 times better than any of us did. Right. Um, uh, but we did fine and I'm not complaining, but it was a really tough year. And uh, I ended up having like a couple little strokes that year and a couple heart Oof. attacks. Yeah. It was a tough year. Yeah. And, um, and, and I just like, I had to get out. So a lot of people noticed my a very abrupt departure. Mm-hmm. from it was like i was i was balls to the wall on this 3d studio thing for like 10 years and then poof right i disappeared and um i never really talked about it much in fact i hid all of my health issues uh, really really well throughout mm. that period and um i would overcompensate by every time i would show up at at autodesk or at a trade show it was all like Hawaiian shirts and flip flops. And right. I had a ponytail and it was like the ponytailed Yoast is on the scene. And I just made it look like it was all effortless right. on our part. And remember, we were five guys doing what Alias was doing with this huge team of, I don't remember how many, but we're talking dozens, 50 people, I think, right. on that team. And five and we guys. Were, <laughs> and we were five guys and we were eating their lunch, you right. know. And, yep. and, and you can imagine the kind of stress that caused. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was really bad. And, um, and we were all like happy to get out. I mean, Tom was ready to just stick with it. And of course, he's, he's still the, you know, he's the reason why it's really going as strong as it is, along with a couple other people there. But Tom being product manager now is the greatest thing that could possibly happen mm-hmm. for, for Max. And, and so, so, you know, then I got out and, and I and I'd also been frustrated for the last few years that I wasn't able to be creative. That whole Surreally Studios thing that I had, you know, fantasized about when I was a, a teenager mm-hmm. never really came to pass. I was making tools that allowed other people could right. to achieve that. You know, we used to I used to give these talks at SIGGRAPH, you know, for you know, lots of people would show up to our Autodesk user events. At you know, I don't know, a thousand people, whatever, all of our users would show up, we'd have these big parties. And I would give this talk that, um, you know, 3D Studio was just a finger pointing at the moon, you know, like, like, it's just this step along the way, you know, our goal was, was really to give people the freedom to be ultimately visually creative in their basements. And, and people would always send me letters and things about how they were able to take out this small loan and quit their, you know, boring job for the man. And, Yep. you know, startup shop in their basement and support their family and how grateful they were. And, and I was jealous all about all these, like I'm killing myself here. And all these guys are having all this great time being creative. I couldn't even get time to use my tools. <sighs> yeah. I'm making teapots. <laughs> yeah. Developer and, art. <laughs> and, and I cost a hedra, you know what I mean? Making yeah. shit like bouncing up. <laughs> So, uh, yep. so I was really frustrated. In addition to all these health issues and things, I was just really frustrated. And it really wasn't just about synthetic imagery for me. I, you know, I'd been uh, a wannabe filmmaker when I was a kid. You know, mm-hmm. I once got Francois Truffaut to sign my eight millimeter camera. Oh my gosh! In, in, Are you serious? A, no, at Avery Fisher Hall at the at the premiere of the Story of Adele H. I was in high school. I was in film production class, and I had a I had a camera that belonged to the school, and I brought a green sharpie, and I, you know. I waylaid him, you know, I ambushed him on his way out of the box at Avery Fisher Hall, Lincoln Center. Right. And I, and I held up my camera with the Sharpie. I was like, maestro, please <laughs> sign my camera. He's like, what the fuck? And he <laughs> takes the thing and he signs the camera. And I had this oh camera my gosh. S- signed by Francois Truffaut, who was real. He was really one of my biggest idols. Yeah. And, and so this was always like the stream. I wanted to be a filmmaker. I had been kind of caught in this backwater of synthetic imagery it wasn't particularly satisfying to me on the storytelling level Mm -hmm. and so i i so we you know we sold out and i i actually had some more surgeries and luckily uh the surgeries i had in 1999 uh basically solved all of my problems and i became super healthy for the first time in my life wow that's nice and have been for the last whatever 21 years right and it and it and that uh you know, my wife and I adopted this beautiful girl from China in the year 2000. And, uh, and then I, you know, I started like, there weren't digital 
movie cameras at the time, but right. I got like the first little Nikon digital cameras and I started taking, you know, I got Photoshop and yeah. taking pictures and it was like, oh, raw files and oh, that's really interesting. And I got more and more into photography until then eventually, you know, you could, you know, make little movies with these cameras. And I started making movies and I, 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 I made a movie about, I, I had been a volunteer fire lookout on top of our, our local mountain, Mount Town okay. Pius. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I, over the uh, 2009, 10, 11, I would take a lot of pictures. I started making little movies with like whatever little video capabilities there were. I made one in 2012 called Day in the Life of a Fire, Fire Lookout that won a Vimeo staff pick award and uh, wow. went viral. And uh, it was like, whoa, I could be a filmmaker. <laughs> I have a filmmaker now. That's awesome. And it was great. It was it was great. It was like oh you know, Cerulean Studios is coming, right? And 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 I then just started getting more and more into uh, you know making films from 2012 to uh, to 2017, late 2017, early 2018, and then I started noticing all this you know 360 video stuff starting to all happen. Right. Yeah. And it was like, oh, this is it. But I remember it as a QuickTime VR was around 90, like that time was happening. QuickTime VR, but there were no real tools to make right. stereoscopic. No. 360, like 360 video actually wasn't very interesting to, interesting to me, but to do it, you know, in stereo, right. that was interesting. Mm -hmm. And so um, three years ago, I... I, mean, I didn't really want to build a GoPro rig. I, I had read about all these synchronization issues and trying to get stereo out of those. Is, it, was not, it was not very good. Mm -hmm. And so there was this uh, camera, the first, it was this Insta360 camera. It was okay. like a, a ball size of a grapefruit. Okay. And, I, and I bought one of those in late um, 2017 Okay. and did some tests and it was, um, I don't know, I don't want to be disparaging to anybody. Let's just say it didn't live up. This isn't the one that you throw up in the air, is it? No, no. It was okay. a, it was like a three thousand dollar camera. Oh, okay, okay. And and it just had six lenses and the overlap. There just wasn't much overlap. I could not get really good parallax. Got it. You know, the, the, it was. I couldn't get a satisfying stereo image. Okay. Out of this camera. And I, and I was really excited about, you know, 3D. And I thought, wow, this integrates my 3D experience and my filmmaking and like finally blah, blah, blah. And, um, but then I got very disappointed. It was like that ISDN experience. Like I was super hot to go, but then, bah. and then a, a really, really good friend of mine and one of my partners and actually one of the members on the board of this nonprofit that I'm about to get to tell you about, bring you mm -hmm. up to speed. Um, this guy named David Lawrence, uh, this, he had been at ILM. And he's just one of my great friends now. And he told me about this this guy in Shenzhen in China named Kinsen Liu, who okay. had a company called Zcam. And um and they had this thirty five thousand dollar V one pro camera with uh you know it was like nine lenses, eight around and one up, and and it was known for really great stereo imaging. And there was like no way I'm gonna spend thirty five thousand dollars. Right. But David said that Kinsen had a new camera under development, which was like the low cost $10,000 version of that. And, uh, and so I, uh, sent, you know, this guy, Ken Lou an email, like I'm this filmmaker in San Francisco. And yep. I heard you got this thing and it's like, I don't know. So he says, well, I'm coming to San Francisco in two weeks and I have something to show you. Okay. And so he comes out in two weeks and shows me and Dave, we go to lunch. He takes this thing out of his bag, which I could, it's actually in the other room, but okay. it's called, it, it, it's just like, looks like this coffee can and it has 10 lenses. Ten? Okay. It's, a, it's like the size of a, like a Maxwell House coffee can with these yeah. 10 small lenses around. And he goes, and then he takes out uh, like a, a Gear VR headset from his bag. Uh -huh. And he says, take a look at this. And he shows me some video produced with this prototype camera. And it's like three feet away from these people at this restaurant in Hong Kong mm -hmm. eating this great meal. And it's like, you could just go out and you could touch 
wow. the food. And there wa it was like the quality of the stereo was so good. And that's because there's like this insane amount of overlap. Between and, the lenses, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I'm like, Kinson, I am your man. I am, I am your prototypical indie filmmaker who wants to use a tool like this, you know, to produce immersive cinema. Right. And, and he's like, great, I will give you this camera. And he handed it to me. And, um, and he said, I have another one. I have a, we have two prototypes. This is one and there's another one. And, and you and me will have the only cameras for the next six months and you can crank shit out and wow. tell me, you know, what's wrong with it. Okay. And the short story is there really wasn't a lot wrong with it. Okay. Um, and I was producing the incredible quality, uh, footage and uh there was this guy roman dudek in spain who worked for a company called uh mystica um mystica is it mystica who mm -hmm. made a, a stitcher uh called mystica vr which yeah. um uh which i i sent him some data he made a calibration profile and it gave me all the the tools i needed to work with that stereo data okay and uh and then i got the first one of those cameras in june of 2018 and um, and then in, in, uh, I, I was thinking like, what am I going to do with this? So now I can do this and I've got my little, you know, 3d 360 studio set up. <laughs> yeah. What is it good for? And, uh, I was, I, I had done a whole bunch of tests. I'd done a lot of tests and I thought, well, you know what? It's, it, it can record this sense of presence. And I was talking to a friend of mine uh, about this, who, is, who lived in Hawaii, who actually happened to be um, the physician for a, a spiritual teacher, Ram Dass. Mm. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he wrote a book called Be Here Now in the early 70s. And um, I had actually spent some time with him when I was 15. I happened to run into his little commune while I was on a road trip with with one of my friends and we spent a couple of days there and I remember like, Oh, my, my, my friend said, I'm Ron Doss's doctor. You could do, he's not really well. You could do uh, like a, uh, an experience with him. And they call these like a Darshan experience where you're present in the, in the presence of a teacher and, and you know, he's probably going to die soon. So let's get something recorded. And I, and I went out to Maui with this camera and I recorded him. I recorded another friend of mine, relaying a powerful experience he had. I brought this footage home. I looked at it and, you know, I was like, this is actually really powerful to have mm -hmm. this, this, you know, this direct connection. And I have, I have a, f a friend of mine who's an actor, Peter Coyote. Okay. And, um, I asked him, he had helped me write the script for one of my films about Mount Tam, the invisible peak. Mm -hmm. And he narrated it. And, and I called him up and I was like, Hey man, you're a Zen priest. Let's do one of these teachings. And, uh, and so he, we did one with him and I was like, this is really something to this. And I did another like half a dozen of those over the next few months. And then at some point, um, a, a brilliant, uh, engineer at, uh, Oculus named Eric Chang sent me an email and said that, Hey, you know, we'd like, we like what you're doing with this stuff. We'd, we'd like you to do more. And, uh, we, you know, we'd like to throw a little bit of money at you to kind of step it up to the next level. And I said, you know, if, if you give me any money, I'm going to give it all to this friend of mine named Adam Lofton, who is this brilliant director. And um, I'll bring him in. I'll be the technologist. I don't really need the money that badly. Uh, I, I, I'm doing okay. Okay. Um, Adam's got a young kid. Let's give all that money to Adam and we'll direct uh, eight experiences uh, that with, with, you know, that are, have much more intention behind them than just setting up the camera. And we did eight of those things and they were like three of them were just amazing. And the, the other ones were really good and they really proved that we could do something. And over the course of that, I thought, well, this is something that I could, um, I could do for a long time. And a friend of mine convinced me to set up, um, a nonprofit and we set up this nonprofit called the wisdom VR project www.wisdomvr.org, right? Www .wisdomvr right? Yeah. That's my email address. That's your email, yeah. <laughs> so we went to the trouble of, you know, setting up this IRS 501c3, which is, you know, they're not trivial, but right. wasn't wasn't the hardest thing in the world. And um, and so we did these nine, and they're like, what are we going to do? And then a friend of mine here, uh, after the pandemic uh, started and the shutdown was happening, and I thought, ugh, you know, we're going nowhere now. And uh, But she told me about this this incredible 
emergency room doctor who had just gotten sick with COVID-19 and almost died, and he might make a great subject for a Wisdom VR project. Interesting. And he, he, uh, he lived in Santa Fe. He operated five emergency departments, four in California and one in Los Alamos. Mm -hmm. And so on his next trip out here, we sat down on my patio and the guy had a lot of charisma and, and it was obvious that there was a really good story into the pandemic through his eyes. Really yeah. unique. I mean, he had four pulmonary embolisms and had massive inflammation Oof. and came very, very close to dying. Mm. And, 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 he, and he also was like trying to save people's lives. At the same and, time, yeah. <laughs> and, and so it was a great story. I thought, well, this is a good one. And, uh, and they, we had CT data for him and I found a company that could do uh, 3D visualization of the CT data. Um, and and, I, and I, so I made a proposal to Oculus again. It was like, hey, um, you know, we could do this. This is kind of interesting. They're like, oh yeah, that is kind of interesting. And we kind of got started on telling the story. And we were, so we saw that there, the story definitely had this human perspective and it had kind of a big macro perspective about how the global situation uh, it was really exacerbating the pandemic, you know, climate change and, yep. you know, economic disparities and racial strife, all that. So we were kind of telling the story within that context, but then we didn't have this kind of microscopic cellular level. And it was like 3D studio, you know? <laughs> This is yep. what 3D animation is for. It was like the whole You finally about, got to use your software. <laughs> like, Cerulli <laughs> Studios is coming, right? So yeah. it's like, we used to talk about how, you know, the reason for 3D animation is like, if it's too small, if it's too large, if it goes too fast, if it goes yep. too slow, those are the greatest, you know, opportunities for 3D animation. Yeah. And, and so I, you know, my first thought was like, who do I know who's a great scientific animator? And coincidentally, one of our beta testers, you know, way back, with uh -huh. Max, um, who I had been in touch with, uh, a really sweet guy named Andy Murdoch, who had a little independent studio called Lands of Robots, or no, no sorry, lots, I, yes. of, lots of robots. Lots, lots of, of robots. robots. Yeah, of course, I remember that guy. Yes, because I was a beta tester too, and I was on a lot of the panels, so I remember him very, sp yeah. Well, and if you'd ever seen him, he's like a six foot four Viking yes. with red hair and yep. <laughs> just the sweetest guy. And, and I, you know, been a Facebook friend with him and coincidentally, uh, he and his family moved from San Francisco to Mill Valley, like down the street. Oh my gosh. Wow. And in January, I invited him over to put a set of, you know, goggles on him Yep. and, uh, and show him what I was doing with the wisdom VR project. And, you know, I was, you know, so excited about, you know, my new thing. And, uh, and so that was in January and, uh, we didn't, you know, soon after that, the shutdown happened mm -hmm. and I hadn't really talked to him. And then in July, after we kind of got rolling on this, I, I remembered he had told me that he was bored. Oh, he was raising his two daughters. He wasn't doing a lot of creative work. And I remembered that he had worked with national geographic over like a decade, more than a decade. Mm. had been his work had been nominated for multiple emmy awards okay for scientific visualization like <laughs> including cellular shit right and i was like holy shit this was under my nose the entire time wow so i you know i i, I was like hey andy you want to play and yeah. we don't have much money but like you could be like super creative <laughs> right <laughs> and it could be about the pandemic and it's like incredibly relevant and you know, we've got this story and, you know, I've got this amazing camera, um, of which, by the way, there are only 20 in the world before Zcam stopped making them. Oh my gosh. Okay. There yeah. You go. It was this weird custom lens. Then, then they, they stopped making the lens and they're like, okay, it doesn't, this whole backwater of 3d immersive video is not making any money for us anyway. And we're just back. Okay. So I've got one of 20 of these cameras. Uh, Andy was pretty impressed with the, you know, the, our, the quality of our stereo. We actually produce the best stereoscopic imaging, you know, of any 3D, 360 immersive um, uh, uh, studio on the planet who is using off-the-shelf hardware, turnkey okay. hardware. I mean, Felix and Paul in, in uh, Toronto do a really great job. Uh, right. All that stuff is custom built, although they're using the Zcam V1 Pro up on the space station right now. Okay. They got, they got two of them. There was a big SIGGRAPH presentation last year about that, which is pretty incredible. Right. But, um, so, but, so Andy was excited enough to say, yeah, 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 I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. 
so, you know, we start doing some tests and he does some really great things inside the cytoplasm of the cell and the virons. And it becomes obvious really fast that um, uh, we have to produce like seven minutes of animation in two months. And not only yep. this, get this, Chris, it's 7K by 7K. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? You need so, some render power. <laughs> so there was like 50 megapixel images. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seven minutes in two months uh -huh. with a guy and a computer. Yeah. And so so we have, he has like a five-year-old box computer with like an ancient NVIDIA card. So the first thing right. we do is we call up one of our old product managers, Frank Delise, who's mm -hmm. over at NVIDIA now. Right. And it's like, hey, Frank, we're doing this really cool project about the pandemic. Do you think you can throw like some Titan cards at us? Right. And he's like, yeah, absolutely. No problem. What's your address, Andy? Yeah. And then, you know, Andy buys a new box machine, sure. you know, yep. and we and, and we get two Titan cards, like a Titan RTX. And, and then and then it's like, well, you know, we have all this rendering to do. And and I didn't even know what Phil Miller was doing at the time. <laughs> okay. I knew that he wasn't at NVIDIA anymore. And Andy goes, you know, Phil is, is at Chaos Group now. Right. And Andy had been showing me all these tests he'd done, even in January when we got together again. He was showing me all these tests he'd done with Tyflow. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. And Tyson, Tyson is just this crazy genius. Yeah. And, and I, was, I, I was really impressed. And, I, and it had been in the back of my mind, like, oh, yeah, one day I want to do something with Tyflow and Max. Yep. This is just too cool. This is like a dream. And, and so he said, I've been doing these experiments with Tyslo, and there's this fur shader in V-Ray yep. that has like tremendous potential for complexity. You know, mm -hmm. we can use it for a lot more than fur. Yeah. And we can use it for like this, <laughs> this phospholipid bilayer thing that <laughs> is around all of our epithelial cells. And we can do it for all the cilia on the outside of the epithelial. Okay. Like, we can use this fur shader for everything. And not only that, they have this cloud rendering platform right. at, at Chaos Group, and it's called the Chaos Cloud. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we could theoretically just, like, actually render this stuff. And so, but, 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 Phil, hi, Phil, it's been a long time. <laughs> How you doing? Here's our, we're doing this really great project about the pandemic. It's probably, like, the most amazing creative project you could possibly do about the pandemic. Right. Where we're, we're giving people an immersive experience, you know, at, at the you know human level, at the macro level, and at the microscopic level, microscopic, yeah. which we could only do inside of Max, and we can only really achieve these kinds of render outcomes with your cloud. <laughs> and like, do you think this is something that would interest you know the people in uh, you know in Europe? Right, right, and, right. And and so uh, you know he made a presentation. They're like, yeah, this is actually you know pretty cool. Oh yeah. You know, I'm, I'm somebody <laughs> asked like, do you think Yoast can actually do this? Yeah. And I'm you know Phil, I'm sure you know. Oh um, yeah, yeah. He he attested <laughs> to my indomitable power of will. Yep. To pretty much produce anything. You know, I, my I always think if I can produce a hologram of it in my mind, it's just like. A series of steps. My mom always used to say, really, there's nothing in the world that's hard. It's just like, how many steps does it have? <laughs> yeah. It's just like, so it has like a thousand steps. Little did I know back in July that, um, that doing a half an hour stereoscopic, you know, 360 degree piece with, um, with 85 7K video shots like stereoscopic video shots along with seven minutes of animation and you know the original music and everything that goes along with everything like this you know would actually put me in a state of being that was as intense as anything i ever experienced back wow. in the max days yeah. like you know i i didn't think i was going to be doing 18 hour days back to back for weeks and weeks at a time ever again right and I'm 61 now, man. I'm not really <laughs> built for it. I mean, I usually like hike around and stuff. And I'm, I mean, you know, I, I work four or five hours in front of the computer a day. And, right. and I, you know, I, I like to cook and hang out with my family and watch movies. And, you know, I like to have a life. Right. We used to, we used to, the old days, it was all like, oh, we're on the deferred life plan, you know. And right. we're going to, you know, one day have a life. And I actually had a life for like 20 years. And then this project came along. It's like, what? You know. 
it just blew up into that exact same state. Of course, this is going to end on November 12th, which is when our deadline is, which yep. is like 25 days away. Right. And as long as keep, as, as long as Phil keeps funneling credits <laughs> yep. into our, into Andy's account, we will actually make it. I think you'll make um, it. I think, I, think, I think we're gonna we're gonna get pretty close. I mean, it's I mean, you know, we're I'm excited shooting. because it's it's right around the time that that you know this podcast is going to come out. Mm. <laughs> it's 30 years of 3D Studio. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and it's my 300th episode of this oh, podcast. Oh no way! <laughs> yep. <laughs> so it's all coming together, no, and I'm I think it's gonna yeah yeah, so, yeah. so you totally get it. A lot of people who haven't seen me or my work over the last 30 years don't don't really can't really appreciate what this moment is all about and 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 i can even talk you know talk to my old buddies on the phone you know about cerulee studios like haha finally did it right 2020 might have been a fucking shit year but <laughs> finally did it yep and um and so yeah, you know it, back it, you in the 70s thinking about what you were going to do in that studio you know right and we were thinking of 2020 and what we were going to do in the pandemic and so you know it's been really hard you know um last week physically it was particularly hard like my whole right side was in pain and mm. and but i've i've done you know I, I managed to fit in some early morning hikes i've been hiking hiking down to the back of muir woods at 6.30 in the morning, doing these seven mile hikes three times a week. Nice. And just doing a lot of like qigong and stuff and getting my qi going and meditating more. And, right. and I, I feel good, I feel good. Good. And, and my, my partner, Adam, due to family issues, he had to actually move t to the jungles of Hawaii this okay. Sunday. Cause uh, the, I guess, you know, his family, his family needed him there. Right. And, uh, and he has his, so we had to, you know, we're, so we've got, I've got these very powerful machines here in my studio, like a, you know, $20,000 Mac Pro, and I'm talking to you on a super right. beefed up iMac Pro, and there's a PC down over there, and right. um, he's using my machines from his laptop remotely from the jungle, but he's got little solar panels on his roof with these little batteries, and like we have to, you know, allocate what time he's going to be online with me, and wow. so we're, we're doing all the final posts, we've been doing all this conforming, and premiere and stuff you know and he's he's a perfectionist and and like i said i'm adhd and i'm very nonlinear, and i'm you know i haven't done all this very detailed work i used to be good at it back in the max days i you know i had my techniques it's been a long time since i had to be super kind of obsessive compulsive about details and i'm constantly i wouldn't say pissing adam off but i'm constantly disappointing adam with my lack of perfect adherence to standards because you can imagine with every one of these video shots yeah you know it all they all you know all has to go through rig removal and you yep. know zenith cleanup and shadow removal and then you know compositing in a lot of cases and uh and then sharpening and so you know and then everything you know has to go into these bins that where we can do these conforming processes really easily and it you know i've got these big spreadsheets and everything but um it's really hard to keep it all straight when you've got you know almost a hundred of these gigantic shots 7k by 7k you know prores shots that are living in you know six different places wow. so um i've you know i mean i've managed to s stay ahead of adam's wrath <laughs> okay uh, but he's been he's been really patient with me, and uh, we're doing a we're doing a good job, and we're going to make it. I mean, the music's going to be great. Everything's everything's going to be great. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Well, I can't wait. I just actually went to the to uh, to our office because I've been working from home like everyone else. But I I drove to the office to pick up the VR headset to bring it back to home mm. uh, with me, so that I'll make sure that I can check it out in VR when you're able to share it with me for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we'll. You know, of course, the 3D animation is the last thing that's going to get sure. in there, right? <laughs> so um, today is uh, the 15th. Our, our goal actually is to have um, all the animation done by November 1st. Right. And Andy yep. and I just went over the schedule this morning. And, you know, he's already got all the environments done. And we've got, you know, we've got 13 shots and we've got six shots in the can. And... Um, the next three are the really complicated ones, but all the environments are done. 
and we're gonna we've allocated uh, like almost nine days for the next three shots, and then the other um, four shots are very simple, and we've allocated like a day and a half or two days for each of those shots. Okay, and and that gets us to the first, and I, I th you know he's he's just so experienced at at you know production on these things and working with Nat Geo. That okay. I, mean, there, yeah. I don't think there's anyone else I would really trust okay. on this kind of schedule, you know, but um, it's just been a joy to work with them. Well, the cool thing about cloud is that, you know, you just, if you need a lot of frames, you'll, you'll just get a lot of computers. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> right. it's, am it's amazing. Like shots I would take his machine days and days are done in an hour. Yeah, I know. I love it's, that. <laughs> it's, and he's found some bugs in the cloud, by the way. That's good. Good. That's why we need him. We oh, need, yeah. We need been, to, yeah, we need those reports. He's been funneling them, and, you know, Phil's been really great about that. And, yeah. um, you know, we're, no, we're doing really great. So, the, so, absolutely, you know, Chaos Cloud is the enabling technology behind all the visualization in this piece. That's and, awesome. And, you know, it's going to be out on Oculus TV, and um, it'll be featured as a, uh, <laughs> so it'll be on Oculus TV as a 3D 360 piece, but I don't know if you know about, Oculus venues and this Facebook Horizons thing. It's like I've heard. Go ahead and tell our, so, our you know, listeners. So Facebook here. has this idea the the metaverse. You know, Ready yep. Player One mm -hmm. kind of. You know that the the what did they call that in Ready Player One? The um, oh uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, what was the, it called? I forget. <laughs> I forget. Yeah. You know that thing. The grid? No, not the grid. That's Tron. Um. <laughs> <laughs> the metaverse. The me yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Um, and so uh, Facebook has a you know a, a, an alpha of an early version of this called Horizons. And uh -huh. in Horizons, there's a place you can go called Venues, and it's a virtual six-off movie theater, and you and your friends can hang out in a lobby for a while. And then you can walk into a theater, and and you're six-off in the theater, but you know you're looking up at this screen, and what you're seeing is a is a monoscopic 180. Okay. Film together. Because of course you can't mix some arbitrary stereoscopic 360 thing that's with, read off right. with with a sixth off world, you'd get an instant headache. Right, right, right. So so it's like a traditional theater. Like you and your friends. It's like a dome theater, basically. It's, yeah, it's like a it's yeah, it's like a super cinemascope, you know, one eighty by uh one it's a one eighty by one eighty, basically. It's from, you know. Right. And and so it'll be featured. They'll do a feature of it there, and then it'll live on Oculus TV. And um, you know, you know, it'll, it'll, you know, whatever, you know, it'll get what it gets. But we're also going to do an, an HD uh, cut of the visualization stuff for Chaos. Awesome. So we'll, we'll, so we'll do you know whatever it is. I mean, uh, you know, four minute piece okay. where we will narrate. Like in the in the film, there's the film is really about story and it's about his story. And, it's, and we don't go into talking about the details of what's happening in the cytoplasm mm -hmm. when you know the viron gets invaginated through endocytosis and releases its RNA, which you know is transcribed by the ribosomes into these new proteins that migrate through you know <laughs> exocytosis back into the nasal pharynx and all this stuff. We okay. don't get into boring people that we just show mm -hmm. it to them, right? Okay. But we will do a boring HD cut from the 360 <laughs> video for chaos. Okay. So you guys can use that like this, this, this is pretty cool, right? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And then of course you can point to all your customers who have headsets to, to look at this piece. Yeah. Um, yeah, for on sure. Oculus, you know? Yeah. For sure. For sure. So, so that's the story. So you asked like how this all started. Yeah. And I pretty much think you I took, took me through the whole <laughs> story <laughs> the last 40 years. <laughs> to, to this very moment. Right yeah, now. that's pretty awesome. I'm very right excited. Now. I'm very excited about this. And I'm very excited about the fact that we got to, you know, talk to you. I, I just, you know, when Phil was telling me about this, because Phil, I, I sort of run the, the labs thing. And so Phil and I and Lon and, and Vlado, we all get on our call on, on Thursdays. And he's like, well, Gary called me about this crazy VR thing he wants to do. He wants to use cloud. He wants to use Typeflow. He, he's in love with V-Ray. I was like, well, that's great. And it goes, not only should you do that, but we should have him on the podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, right it, was on. A, it was a perfect <laughs> idea. So I, I was very excited. I totally think that this is a great opportunity for us to, to do things and to try new things as well. You know, it's, it's been really, uh, really cool to do that for sure. Yeah. And how many of your customers have been doing, you know, stereoscopic high res 360 video? 
A lot, actually. Uh, really? Not video as much. Not probably not as much as what you're doing, but there's a lot of architecture people that are doing a lot uh -huh. of 360. Right. That's what and, and it, 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 it Yeah, because it just makes sense in, in architecture, right? Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, but you know what? I think Phil told me this. So, yeah, Phil told me this recently. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to do with architecture, but the thing that architects hate about showing their clients visualizations in the headset yeah. is that they can't see their facial expressions. Yes. When they put the headset on. When they put the headset on. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So they can't they can't read them. Yep. And yeah. and and Phil says it's kind of a deal breaker for a lot of architects because they depend on that visual connection with their customers so much. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, huh? Yeah, it's weird. There's a lot of but it you know, the whole point of VR is to take you to a place that you haven't been before or doesn't exist. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right, that you can't visualize. And so architecture is just like the perfect world for that. But but you're I agree. right. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I think the architects have to give up that, you know, archaic notion right. of reading the face of the client and just know that, you know, they can get the information they need from the client and that the client is getting the highest quality presentation yeah. of, of their data that they could possibly get. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Well, cool. I don't want to take too much more of your time because I think we've got an, an, yeah, a we huge amount of story. <laughs> soup to nuts on here. Soup to nuts. So, but I really appreciate it. I will, I was going to warn you that basically your video has been going in and out. So I'll probably just have a still of you for the video if that's okay. Uh, but, uh, but I got all the audio. So we're all set on the audio. Well, the podcast itself is an audio podcast. It's an audio right? only, but sometimes we put a video up for, for, for people who want to watch videos. But, uh, but yeah, mostly, I, I mean, like 99% of the people. I, yeah, just I don't, I don't care audio. if anyone watches it, of course. <laughs> like, like, really? Yeah, it's, it's cool. Listen, this has been amazing. I, like I said, I'm, 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 I, if someone had told me that I'm going to be having, you know, a podcast at some point and then in my 300th episode, I'm going to be interviewing Gary Yost, I would say, like, <laughs> Not no, that's not going to happen. But it did, it did, yeah, and so here I am. So say, yeah, it's not going to happen because he's probably dead. <laughs> no, you're not dead, but you're, you're definitely yet. very alive. You're alive with amazing ideas. I'm so glad you were able to think about you know that thing back in the '70s, and here you are actually making things and finally using 3D Studio for your for your own good and for your own creation. So that's wonderful. Well, thank, thank, thank you for being a part of it, man. Yeah. Chaos Labs, and you know. You know, who would have known that V-Ray was going to become such an integral part of me achieving my dream? I know. I know. That's wonderful. I'm really glad that we're able to make that happen for you. So that's been really great. So yeah. thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me, Chris. You take care.